So let's let's give applause for them. Uh, we we want to thank you for coming all the way from Portland, from USA. And if you're into JavaScript and if you're into art, uh, I think you'll be very pleased with this talk. And I won't talk any much. I'll give the floor back to George. Thank you. Hvala puno, dobro došli, and ne govorim serbski. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming. The name of this talk is JavaScript for Artists. And we're going to look at, today we're going to look at how JavaScript is a, I think, a very unique platform for creating artistic and creative works. And we're going to talk about that, what that means, and why I think that's important, not just for beginning or intermediate developers, but developers with all skill levels. I think that um, exploring and creating with our code is something that uh, is beneficial to us at any stage in our career and something we could all stand to do more of. And before I continue, am I, am I audible? Am I reasonably audible out there? Okay, it's, it sounds a little different up here and I just wanted to make sure before I keep talking. Before I dive into the subject too closely, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I find when I go to conferences and I listen to people talk, I tend to remember things a little bit better if I, if I get to know the person a little bit, if it's personalized to some extent, that might just be me, I don't know. But if I can remember one or two things about them, I am much more likely later to remember the talk or some subjects and go back to that and actually reference it. So on this slide, I always like to put a few fun random facts about me to introduce myself. So my name is George. Um, I'm an independent web developer. I've done that for about 13 years out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, I think in JavaScript years, that's like 75 years, depending on how you look at it. And so I can retire soon. That's great. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert. That's a somewhat new thing. That's been a, a fun uh, change in my career. I've gravitated towards doing more mentorship type things lately, uh, mentoring people one on one, running workshops, boot camps, things of that nature. Um, if you're interested in that, please feel free to talk to me later. Um, now, one of the more funny facts. One of my most known open source projects is a project called Konami JS. I'm curious, has anyone heard of it? Every once in a while, I get a few hands. I see one hand. It might be a polite hand. I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> um, it, I made this over 10 years ago, and it's a silly Easter egg script that enables the Konami code on your website. Um, and when you enter the Konami code, something happens. That doesn't sound very novel. That's kind of a programming 101 project. The, the only novel thing that maybe my thing did is it worked on smartphones with gestures at the time. And really, more than anything, the timing was right. So like, companies like, like Marvel and Tesla and, and Newsweek, and, like everyone who was working on sites back then used my project. And I got really excited. And I'm, I'm happy that today my most seemingly meaningful contribution to open source is still a very frivolous kind of fun project uh, that seems to be my brand <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Um, oh yeah, related to that, I mentioned Marvel. I accidentally broke marvel.com for about a minute when I, uh, someone pointed out to me they're using my project. I got very excited and I pushed a really quick git push to fix something and I found out they were linking directly to uh, the file on GitHub, like the raw source. And I don't know how it broke exactly, but I went to their site and it was, it was a mess. So that was kind of funny. I don't think anyone ever noticed. Um, and lastly, I once, I once ran a marathon in North Korea and I accidentally cheated. Uh, people tend to remember that one. So maybe you'll remember that and something else from the stock. And here's some proof. Uh, I turn around like the slides are here. They're not. <laughs> uh, if you ever want to find North Korean flags, that's a good place to go. And there's more proof. Here's my certificate <laughs> of accomplishment, I guess. Um, but more importantly and relevant to this talk, I, I like to make things. I really like to make fun, interesting, creative things, at least in, in my opinion. Um, you know, I find that that process, it keeps me interested in learning new things. You know, in this industry, there's new frameworks and technologies like every six months or less. And it's really hard to keep up on it. But I find that having creative art projects of my own to work on and dabble with, it keeps me fresh and interested and it keeps me from burning out for the most part. Um, yeah, and I also enjoy not just using, you know, exploring new tools in that way, but I like pushing them maybe past the boundaries of how they're intended to be used sometimes. Sometimes at the fringe, you can find uh, 
very, sometimes you make interesting discoveries that end up being useful for other applications. So let's get to the topic. So the talk is called JavaScript for Artists. So you might be asking yourself some questions, things like, what do we mean by art exactly? Uh, what is art? Which is a huge question that I'm not going to answer, really. <laughs> and maybe why JavaScript? You know, Zashtal JavaScript. <laughs> Zashtal JavaScript. Um, so those are all good questions. Um, first of all, what I mean when I'm talking about art, a lot of you probably have your own idea of what, I, what art is when you came to this talk. I'm also willing to bet a number of you came because you have no idea what this talk is going to be about. Some of you might have thought of something um, maybe like this, like very Western painting, something you might see at a museum. Or maybe you thought of something a little more abstract, kind of like this. Others here, your brain might have gone straight to music, something totally non-visual. Or others might have thought of something totally kinetic in dance, which is still art, you know, some kind of expression. Or maybe because this is sort of a tech conference, and I feel like this is a more common thing at, uh, in, these sort of, in this sort of atmosphere, maybe you thought of something a little more experiential, something that kind of combines an installation of sorts. Um, or maybe something like this. This photo kind of makes me laugh. I like to sit on it for a moment. It's <laughs> I think he's painting with, with uh, VR goggles on. So all of those things are somewhat correct and apply to what we're talking about today. As far as my talk and what I mean by art, as far as a definition for today and for this talk, I'm going to say anything created for a joyful exploration of, uh, of a discipline, uh, an expression of something captured only through the work itself, or my favorite way to define this. Oh, wait, no, I have four. I'm sorry. Uh, embracing one's curiosity in a pursuit to find an answer to a question. Or more succinctly, something that's not precisely useful but not exactly pointless. So that is, that is my working definition for what we're talking about with art today. And here I have just some random things I made sort of in that vein, some visualizations and, and things like that. That one's kind of hard to see, I realize. In that vein, I'd like to share with you for a moment a couple of things I'm, I've made that sort of fit this mold. They're very they're simple things, but these are kind of the, the things I do to get going in the morning sometimes. You know, some people have crosswords to get their brain started. I like to sit down and make little visualizations and, and just little games and things that I find interesting. Um, sometimes they are things like, oops. Oh, there we go. There's my mouse. Things like that, which I realize are hard to see on the screen, perhaps. There we go. One of the things I really enjoy making are not just works and arts that exist purely in the code itself, but I like to make tools that are, you know, sometimes sort of abstract drawing tools that allow me to sketch and record and, and create things kind of like this. Oh, let's see. Bear with me, my, my internet's been in and out, so some of these demos may not quite work, I'm realizing. Here we go. So now I can, I can demonstrate a little more clearly what's going on here. There we go. That one eventually gets going here. And let's do one more here. Oh, this one was an idea I had somewhat recently to... Who knows what a camera lucida is? Who, who's familiar with the camera obscura? 
that's more commonly known, I think. It's, it's very similar. Uh, but the, the gist of the idea is it's a, a drawing aid that an artist can use to look at a subject, and they will see a reflection in um, the mirror is angled in a particular way, so that basically they, it'll look as though they'd be able to trace it in real life. And actually, if I demonstrate the effect here, let's see. So I will look at this, and I'll pause the image. <laughs> And then I just made a tool that let me trace, basically, what I saw a little more, well, a little more poorly <laughs> at this moment. And then I have some tools down here to vary the opacity and, oops, I have to go the other way. See how my drawing's coming along, kind of compare it like this? Anyway. These are some of the things I'm talking about, some of the simpler things. So I have a loose definition of what I mean by art at this point. Um, so back to the bigger question. So why JavaScript? It basically boils down to three reasons. It's, it's everywhere. It's on the server. It's on the browser. It's on hardware. It's, um, it, you know, it's anywhere computing is happening. You can pretty much be guaranteed to find JavaScript. For better or worse, there is a low barrier to entry. You know, TypeScript people probably think for worse, I would imagine. Um, it's, but for that reason, it's actually a really great tool for this kind of exploration because anybody at any particular skill level can start dabbling. You can start writing JavaScript tomorrow really poorly, but you're still learning some of the basic tenets of programming and can start exploring you know, creative things and, and creating works. Um, and it's also where the people are. There are so many conferences and meetups and events surrounding JavaScript. You know, that may not always be the case, but I, I would say today is a very good time to be a JavaScript developer of some kind and probably for the next five years at least, I would guess. Um, JavaScript is also kind of uniquely suited for creating fun, interactive, experiential, and creative things. Uh, part of it's like the ubiquity that we mentioned before. A big part of it is the browser. The browser is an interface that I think we kind of take for granted when it comes to the APIs that it affords us and how easy it makes it to do certain things that in other programming languages or other contexts might require a lot more work. You know, we have things like the like the media capture API, that, that last example I showed you where I was tracing my face. You know, with like three or four lines of code, I can... Uh, the browser can uh, you know, make use of the camera that's on my computer, and now we can actually look at the person who's looking at whatever it is you made and interact with things that way. You know, we have a microphone, we have a Canvas API, we have uh, geolocation, if you want to have your artwork be location uh, affected. Um, it, the browser is a very unique tool that no other language really has access to in that regard. Um, and like I said before, there's so many conferences and things. There's a lot of industry and community support. If, uh, especially in the realm of like machine learning and things like that, there's a lot of exciting new services and APIs coming out. You can pretty much guarantee that if there is a new, if there's a new API for a service or a startup or something like that that's for developers, it's going to offer some kind of JavaScript SDK. There's going to be a way to talk to it in JavaScript. So that's another reason I think it's a very good... Uh, reason to be doing this kind of thing in JavaScript. So why is this important? So as children, we learn through play. And like I said at the top of this, I think that we tend to lose that as we get further into our careers, partly because it's overwhelming. Um, but I, I think there, you know, there's, something, there's something to that. There has to be a way we can sort of maintain that throughout our career. There's a lot of studies that have also shown recently that um, people who dabble in lots of different disciplines uh, tend to do better at their main discipline, their main focus. One of the studies was actually with professional athletes, and they found that athletes who grew up playing a wide variety of sports tend to do a lot better than the ones that would specialize in a particular sport, even though that's not necessarily what you would think. I think in that same vein, uh, creative exploration, creating art, and things like that with JavaScript is a way to diversify the kind of stuff we do, so we're not just constantly you know, going through sorting algorithms and you know, just ramming that through our brain until we, you know, internalize them. Um, let's see here. Uh, lastly, I think about this a lot, given how quickly things change. We cannot be experts at everything. We are guaranteed to be amateurs at something. And I think we should celebrate that we're amateurs sometimes and, and just kind of own it. Uh, and I think that making fun, creative things is a good way to do that. Uh, in that 
same vein, at the top of the stock, I showed you some very simple, like, creative things that I made uh, that I found fun. It doesn't necessarily, I think your approach to programming doesn't necessarily have to be the, um, it doesn't have to be the final output. I think you, the way you approach a very simple problem or a very simple project can also be creative in itself. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. I have another project that I'm working on called 101 Ways to Say Hello World. And basically, in Solomon JavaScript, I'm, I'm trying to literally come up with 101 different ways to say hello world. That is the, that is the one I would probably choose on Stack Overflow if someone asked me. Um, seems correct enough. And then I thought, well, how can I, how, how can I make this harder on myself? What's a more interesting way I can do it? And I thought, well, I could put each letter in an array, and then I could join all the letters in the array, and OK, then we get a hello out world output. And then I thought, maybe I could just visually arrange the code on my page and make it kind of fun. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I pull up a, a project, and the documentation like, looks kind of beautiful in its own way. And then I thought, well, maybe I could do something even weirder. weirder. I could uh, you know, um, figure out, the, uh, I think, the Unicode number, and then I Oh, no, I'm oh, sorry, this one I reversed it. Yeah, so I reversed it. We could do more things with arrays. Or maybe I could find out what the, uh, you know, the char code is for each letter and have an array full of numbers, go through it that way. And it kind of just went so on and so forth, finding more and more weird ways to tackle what, you know, if you just run the program, all of these just say, hello, world. They're not very exciting, but I had a lot of fun trying to come up with more and more convoluted ways to um, do that. Oh, yeah, this one actually extracts the letters required for hello world from the error messages that the browser <laughs> is spitting out. That was kind of a fun challenge. It turns out Node and uh, you know, the JavaScript in the browser have slightly different error messages for certain things, so you, can't, you have to account for it in a different way. Um, oh, yeah, and then the, my recursive approach, that was kind of fun. And then that one is probably very... Oh, that's right. I have a function, a recursive alphabet function, so I have to go, I have to call it as many times as I have to go through the alphabet to find the letter. That's right. I apologize for squinting. I really can't read this code at all from where I'm standing. Normally it's a little bigger. Anyway, you get the idea. I think that when I talk about creativity and art, I feel like this qualifies, like just finding fun, clever ways to amuse yourself. And another thing I mentioned is sometimes through this exploration, sometimes the best things are discovered. Actually, a lot of early, um, a lot of like inventions in early computing were sort of through this joyful exploration by people in the field at the time. I knew a lot of it was a lot longer ago than you probably think. Um, you know, like the first computer music was in 1951. The first synthesized speech was in 1961. Uh, the first image was in 1956. We had animations in 67. 3D animations and like an experiential interactive uh, exhibit in 71. Um, and then some generative poetry in 1952. And I'm going to just show you these really quickly. Um, so. Um, so Alan, the Mark II was designed by Alan Turing and Christopher Strachey, a like famous early computing person, um, was working on it one night late doing something or another and there was a mechanism on the computer that would, th this disc would spin and a tone would sound to let them know that certain processes were done. And he just happened to notice that that tone was at a particular pitch and he could write a program that changed the speed at which that, uh, that you know, that component would spin and thus change the pitch. And so he stayed up all night and he wrote a program that let him write music on the Mark II, which it was not intended to do in the slightest. And so here is a, a recreation of the first song that he wrote on. Um... Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, synthesized speech, it's interesting to me how long ago like that was a thing. I remember when the, um, in Chrome there is the, uh, there's an API where you can have text to speech and it's, it's kind of fun to play with. I haven't, found a, I haven't found a wildly practical use for it, but it is kind of fun. Um, but back in 1961, they were you know, doing this. In the next selection, the computer sings a familiar ditty. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. Um, imagery. So this is really interesting and kind of funny in a roundabout way. Um, 
So I was doing research trying to find out what was the first instance of like an image being used on a computer, and I came across this. This was a um, $238 million piece of military equipment in the US, which is like over $2.2 billion today, which is insane. And nobody took credit for this, but somebody put a pinup lady on, the, it, it's, a ra it's a radar thing, so it's a, um, it would detect whether or not there are enemy planes in the territory. So somebody did this supposedly as part of the startup diagnostic test. You would, you would turn on the machine and you would see this for a while and then eventually when everything was fine, it would go back to doing what it's supposed to do. Um, uh, it's slightly unfortunate that it's like the very first image I could find and kind of, uh, I like to say, maybe a good sign that we need more women in tech because I feel like that probably would not happen today. Um, but I also like that somebody saw, <laughs> it's kind of funny to me, someone saw this $200 million machine and that was the first thing they thought to do with it. They're like, oh. Um, animations go back quite a bit further. This is actually at the Museum of Modern Art now. Some of the, a few of these items are. And here's the one I mentioned up top. This is a 3D animation called Mythical Creature. Um, and what's cool about this one is it's, you can actually interact with it in person. There are controls that allow you to change the color, the direction that the fish or whatever that is, I suppose, is actually swimming. Um, it, it's a really cool experiential interactive sort of a thing. And then last but not least, um, I think this is Christopher, yeah, this was Christopher Strachey again. He wrote a generative poem thing, which was it was a glorified Mad Libs. Who's familiar with what Mad Libs are? I realized before I, okay. <laughs> um, basically, it would just come up with a sentence structure and it would randomly pop in verbs and nouns in certain contexts, depending on um, how things were. Anyway, he would use this to write love letters to his wife while he was working on his computer. Okay, so I, I gave a sort of long-winded example of why I think this is important, how creativity and art sort of push the industry forward, I think. So let's talk a little specifically about what is available to us as JavaScript developers to make creative fun things. Um, I sort of, now this is a woefully incomplete list, but I sort of broke it down into three very broad categories. We have the browser and all of the capabilities and the APIs and things that it brings. Uh, we have JavaScript on hardware, which is a really fun world to explore if you're not familiar with it. Um, and then even though this kind of blurs all the lines in some ways, I, I sort of put AI and machine learning stuff into its own category uh, just because it's so unique and there are some really fun ways we can start to dabble with machine learning stuff and create cool art with that. Okay. So the browser, we have a few... Um, you know, the, the browser is sort of our, like our eyes, our mouth, and our ears, not really our nose, <laughs> to um, interacting with you know, people. We have the DOM, obviously, it allows us to create virtual interfaces and things that um, you know, the, uh, the people looking at our art can uh, interface with. We have Canvas and WebGL if you want to make more visually sophisticated things. If you want to start playing with audio, we have the whole world of web audio, and right now there's some really interesting inventions going on with web assembly and web audio to make that even more efficient. Um, media capture, like I said at the top, you know, the, the things that we make, not only can we look at them, but they can look back at us and they can respond. Um, or they can listen with the microphone and interact in that sort of a way. Um, and then we can also communicate with other things we've made using technologies like WebRTC or WebSocket. So now we have pieces of art that are communicating with other pieces of art anywhere in the world and the users by extension through them. Uh, the browser, I really like the browser. I think it just has a lot of cool things that it lets us do that we, can, we take for granted sometimes. Um, if you want to work with the DOM, obviously, you can work directly with the API in JavaScript. There are some things that exist to make it easier these days. All the browsers are pretty nice. I, I started so long ago, I have to list jQuery because I remember when jQuery came out and like how it made my life so much easier. But these days, 90% of the time, and particularly for like art projects, you probably wouldn't need to do that. Um, if you want to play with Canvas and WebGL, again, you can always, for most of these, obviously, uh, access the API directly in the browser. Um, who's, who's heard of P5 here, P5.js? If you take away nothing else from this talk, I would say go home and play with P5. Who's heard of processing? It's a Python-based 
sort of visualization thing. Okay, it's kind of like processing, but for the browser, it's it's amazing. If you want to have a, if you just if you just want to make a circle that bounces around the screen and have it make sounds when it hits the corners, you can whip that out really quickly in p5.js. Um, web audio, obviously, uh, tone.js is a really great library for uh, creating music and tones and things like that. And again, we have the Media Capture API for looking at and listening to our users. Oh, and WebRTC and Sockets. So let me do a quick overview of uh, JavaScript on hardware and what some of those options look like. Um, oops. So we have, who's heard of the Esperino out of curiosity? They're based out of, I think they were invented in the UK. So the Esperino is amazing. I, it actually has a JavaScript interpreter on board the, it's kind of like an Arduino, but you write JavaScript and it it interprets it and executes it directly on the device. It's maybe not the most efficient thing to do, but it's a lot of fun to be able to write like um, little programs with the lights blink and things like that. This thing that I'm holding up here is actually an Esperino. I've I've reprogrammed it to do some strange things. My computer actually thinks this is a musical instrument, and I can play notes by clicking things, which I might demonstrate a little later here. Um, and we have some other things. Johnny5, in particular, is a really good uh, library for interfacing with all kinds of hardware, um, like Arduinos and, and Raspberry Pis and things like that. So if you want to start experimenting with um, hardware and JavaScript in some capacity, I would suggest starting with those things. And then the one at the very end, I include WebMIDI, uh, which is a browser API, and it allows you to communicate with uh, musical instruments that support MIDI, like, like this thing that I made up here. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and if, you're, if the idea of wiring up circuits and playing with hardware directly is sort of intimidating, then I would suggest maybe start with WebMIDI and make something that just talks to a musical instrument, because a lot of the basic principles, as far as programming goes, are in there. Like, if you want to just create something where I push a button over here in the real world and something happens on the screen, WebMIDI is a perfect technology for that. It's very simple. Let's see. Oh, wait. Did I have that slide up the whole time I was talking? I'm sorry. That was the one I thought was up on the screen when I was saying that. I'll let it sit there for a moment here. So the last thing I'm going to um, talk about real quickly is uh, so AI and machine learning and how we can play with that. So this one in particular I find interesting. Because in my day-to-day -day work as a freelance developer, to be honest, I, I don't run into opportunities to use these things very often. Uh, that's kind of my impression with a lot of people. It's a really interesting technology. We're all sort of wrapping our brains around it. If you work at a very large company, you might have a practical use case for some of these things. But most of us are kind of looking at it, trying to figure out how to apply it and you know, appreciating it, but sort of still figuring it out. Um, Creating art is a really good way to play with uh, some of these machine learning libraries and things. Um, up at the top here, um, ml5.js and magenta.js in particular are two libraries that are um, actually based on TensorFlow, but they have specific functions for creating visualizations and music and things that you might want to do if you're creating art. Um, so I really highly recommend checking those out. Those are a lot of fun. Um, those also all run on the client side, so it will kind of depend on how fast your computer is, whether or not that's an enjoyable experience. If you're making something for a lot of people, you might want to reconsider that because, you know, their laptop might double as a heater, depending on how intense the thing is, and not all phones necessarily can do a lot of these things very effectively. Um, so for those situations, you might want to look at some of the web services that allow us to do the same thing. Um, it's kind of the usual companies you would expect. We have Microsoft, Google, and Amazon offering a lot of uh, machine learning slash AI uh, services. Um, the the trade-off, obviously, is they're, they're not free, and it requires a connection, and you're sort of giving your data to those companies. But the payoff is they're pretty quick, and they're about the same speed for everyone. And also, they can do a lot more. I'm going to demonstrate some facial recognition stuff here in a little bit and show you some of the differences. Um, and then again, uh, oh yeah, the third option with uh, machine learning that not a lot of people know about, there's an experimental browser API called the Shape Detection API. Has anyone heard of that one? I'm curious. 
it's pretty cool. So you have to go to the Chrome flags, and it's under the experimental features, and you have to enable it. But basically, it's a, it's a browser-based API that will allow you to recognize faces in image, uh, extract text from images, and um, uh, barcodes, too, I think, somewhat randomly. It works entirely offline on the client side. It's built into Chromium, and any Chromium-based project will inherit this feature. So if you are using Electron, you could make, um, you could add facial recognition to your Electron app. Or if you're using uh, Microsoft Edge even supports it. So it's, it's kind of cool. It's a little, uh, it is experimental, so there's some things that are broken, but it's, it's very exciting. Um, so yeah, yeah, those are the, so what I just touched on are actually kind of the three main approaches to facial recognition, if that's something you want to add to your project. I think it's a good like first step in learning this area. Um, and so there is a library called faceapi.js that is, um, makes, that it runs entirely on the client side. If you want to experiment with that, you can train your own models and have it set up to recognize your face, or you can download some of the pre-existing models that come with it to generally recognize faces, but also recognize things like expression, uh, emotion, um, the age of the person looking at, uh, looking, you know, or in the image that you're trying to assess. Um, that's a really fun sort of component to throw into a piece. Um, and the code, um, I apologize, I, I would sort of walk you through it, but it's, it's so small up here, I'm having a hard time seeing it, and I'm not sure if it's legible to you there either, so I apologize for that. Um, I can, if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk more about it with you later. Um, so similarly, we can... You know, if we don't want to use something like FaceAPI.js and do it entirely on the client side, we can send it to a service like Azure. Um, that's pretty straightforward. We're basically uploading the image to Azure, waiting for a response, and then we get a JSON object with all the information about how many faces are in the image, how those people are feeling. Uh, we also get more information like whether or not they're wearing a hat or glasses or have a mustache and things like that. And then lastly, that experimental shape detection API looks like this. It's, it's basically as simple as enabling like geolocation or the media capture API. It's actually easier than the media capture API, to be honest. That one has a lot of parameters you have to think about sometimes. This one you can do in just a few lines. Yeah, it's very, it's pretty cool. I look forward to that one becoming more uh, mainstream and popular. So. I want to show you a couple demos based on a couple of these things I've talked about. I want to show you the facial recognition uh, demos and some of that stuff that I was talking about here. So, bear with me one moment. There we go, let's just do this. Okay. the one, let's see. Okay, I will jump straight to this demo that I, let's see here. So one of the things I made, so I, I was playing with the face API, um, face API.js library and all of the, uh, loading all the facial recognition models on the client side and experimenting with that. Specifically, I was playing with the, uh, the one that recognizes expressions and emotions. And I thought it would be, makes, it would be fun to make uh, something that could respond to how I'm feeling. So I made something that 
basically tries to sing me a song if it thinks I'm sad and cheers me up. And let me just demo it here. Okay, so it's looking at me right now. If I smile, <laughs> thinks I'm happy. If I look sad, should start playing a song unless my audio is down. Well, now I really am going to be sad if it doesn't play my song. <laughs> Keeping a straight face for this part is always very hard. Oh. Well, let me see if it responds to other faces too. I can get angry. I can get angry. Maybe. Maybe I can't. I don't know. There we go. <laughs> and if I look surprised, anyway, it's kind of a fun one. Um, the song abruptly stops when I'm angry, so I'm not exactly sure why that didn't work. I apologize for that. Um, doo -doo -doo. Maybe this one works. No, I don't think that's it. Let's see. Well, I tell you what, bear with me one second here. This one should work. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, okay, let me try this. I don't want to hear this song. Let me make sure this one works here. Okay, it has to load the models. Takes a second. Okay, well. So let me show you a... Okay, here we go. So the demo that I showed you, even though it didn't do the part that I really wanted, uses the faceapi.js library to do all the facial recognition on the client side. That'll work offline. This one uses Azure Cognitive Services to do pretty much the same thing, but I wanted to show you all of the extra data that I get. So with faceapi.js, I basically get four, maybe five expressions that it can identify somewhat inconsistently. This one gives me a whole bunch of other data to play with, which is kind of fun. So let me do this and see if my face gets in there, and then I will click on this button. <laughs> and okay, there we go. So it sent that off to Microsoft, and it sent it back to me that quick. So now it's identifying uh, where my face starts in the image over here. All the you can sort of see, a, I don't know if it shows up very well over there, but there's a red rectangle around my face. Um, if we scroll further down, you know, we, the data is a lot more granular. We get a lot more information if we, if we use one of the services for this approach. Um, and then we get, so I'm, I have 3% of a smile, evidently, or rather there's a 3% confidence that I have a smile, which means it does not think I have a smile. Um, it is somewhat accurate with my age. Uh, you know, I can find whether I have a mustache or a beard or side all this data is in there. And you, it's, it's kind of fun because then you can start playing with that and make some really interesting things that respond to this kind of data. And then I think at the very bottom here, we get, uh, let's see. Oh, eye makeup and lip makeup. That's right. That's the other one. The last time I did this demo, I thought I was wearing lip makeup. I'm not sure. It must have been the lighting. And let me, just to compare, I also did the same demo using Google Cloud Vision. That's another service you can use. And it's a very similar process, um, 
but the, the object you get back is very different. So let's do this, and I will try to smile. Or maybe I'll just make a funny face. There we go. <laughs> um, OK, so same sort of thing. We get uh, coordinates that identify the face in the photo. It's also very fast, you notice. That was pretty fast. Um, we know where my left eye is, my right eye, left of my left eyebrow. <laughs> Areas like that, and then we scroll down, and then we get basically just, just different kinds of data when we use these other services. Likelihood of sorrow, likelihood of anger, very unlikely. It's not very unlikely, I'm surprised, but it's... Okay, let's see. Well, I'm going to show you one more demo, even though it, I'm having some demo difficulties today. So let me show you one more that I'm pretty positive will work, and we'll end on that note, I think. Um, this is actually the first sort of art project I made using JavaScript many years ago for a totally, just sort of for a whim. Um, there we go. And so what this does, now I'm nervous that nothing's going to work. Um, so I, 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 uh, I'm a little bit of a musician. I play in a duo with a jazz guy. And we were playing at a winery kind of a situation. And we wanted some kind of visualization behind us while we played. We just decided that would be fun. And I like to make all my projects bigger than they need to be. And so I built this web MIDI based web page where I could hit a button on the floor and have videos and, and random poetry like change behind us. It was pretty pretentious and kind of fun. Um, <laughs> and so I played with it a little bit more and this is the thing I made and it's, it's creating these poems based on famous books and extracting videos from archive.org in the public domain. And it's very simple in principle, but it was a lot of fun to make and kind of touches on some of the stuff I'm talking about. So I've wired it up to recognize my MIDI instrument I'm holding here, and I'm going to hope that this works. So if I give it one click, let's see. And if it doesn't, I have a way to cheat. So oh, we have music going. Oh, OK. So every time I click this, it's going to give me a new poem. It's totally random. It's kind of funny because every once in a while you get something that almost seems like it should make sense. I can change the video with two clicks. And if I want to change the song, try to get three clicks. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> anyway, that one worked okay. So. so let me wrap up here in the last couple minutes. Um, so I showed you, I showed you a couple demos that went sort of smoothly. Um, there is also a whole world of machine learning stuff with. Um, like style transfers and neural net style transfers, it's interesting. It's easy to use and to be honest, like tricky to completely wrap my brain around. Basically, so what we're looking at here are the same photo of myself that I took many years ago. And I took artwork that I made. Some of it was like generative JavaScript stuff and a couple of it was like real artwork I made in real life. And I used um, ml5.js, I believe it was, to... Um, basically create a model of the style of the painting or the, the work and then apply it to that photo of myself. And I have, I have dozens more, but these are just three I picked kind of at random to show you what that looks like. Now, the effect is kind of like a, kind of a cheesy Photoshop filter sometimes, but sometimes it's cooler than that. Um, and so that's sort of the next area that I'm playing with. And for me, it's a really fun opportunity to explore like these machine learning libraries that I otherwise don't have much of a practical use for personally. And I think one of the, that's the image I use to ascertain the style of and applied to, oops, I think the one on the, your left, <laughs> yeah. 
And here's another funny headshot I took a long time ago. It makes me laugh a little bit. I, last conference I was at, they didn't think I was actually this person. It was kind of funny. And I, basically, I took that photo. I did the same thing with some work. And I really like the way that some of these turned out. They actually turned out very cool. And last but not least, this is another project I did. I signed up for this service in the US where I get, I get photographs of my mail every single day. And mostly it's photographs of junk mail, so it's like getting junk mail twice. <laughs> um, but I had this, I thought, well, maybe I'll find some use for this. It's like, you know, collecting junk mail to make a, uh, to cut them out and make like a uh, collage or something. I was collecting digital junk mail to figure out a use for it. And so when I was playing with this neural style transfer stuff, I realized, oh, maybe I could do something there. And what I made was the strange collage of like my junk mail and some other things. Anyway. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, I would love to talk to you about this stuff. And I have, um, yeah, I also have a little website set up called JavaScript for Artists. I have tons and tons of links to libraries and projects and things if you want to see some of these examples and better examples that other people have done out there. So, hvala puno. Thank you, George. It was a great talk. Uh, does anybody have questions for George? You can go find me in the hallway too if you want. That's fine. Hey, George. Okay. First, oh, sorry. Congrats. I didn't see you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for all the great examples. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that uh, not all your um, demos worked. Me no, too. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm really curious if uh, if you have a GitHub repo or something that we can, you know, where we can see your code and I enjoy your uh, your demos because I think they're really cool. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I do have one. Uh, the short answer is I have one up and I'm working on the others. I actually have the the one that I was trying to show that didn't work where you, you make a sad face and it plays a song. That one is up and available and I can send you the link. Um, and, and the other visualizations I showed you earlier, um, I'm working on it and they should be up soon. So I have two questions. Okay. <laughs> First one, uh, how, what's the longest you've ever worked on one of your art projects? <laughs> and do you have any ongoing that just never end? Mm -hmm. And the second one related to that is, uh, when do you decide that you're done? Like, at what point are you satisfied if you are ever satisfied? <laughs> So to answer your first question, I have definitely burned like entire work day. I burned like a whole eight hour weekend day when I should have been doing other things, working on this like it was my job. Um, and I have no regrets about that. Um, one project that I'm, I've been working on, I've had this idea for a year and I, I, I think there's something there and I haven't quite figured it out yet, but I want to make the, the t I have a title for this project, and I'm still figuring out the details. I'm working backwards. So I'm calling it The Story of You. And what I want is I want to get up here, and I want to just start talking and talking about myself and my life, and then using the speech-to-text uh, API to collect the text in real time, kind of like a caption. But then I want to take that text, and I want to use it to pull in images from I'm not even sure where yet, or use that to do some sort of other cool generative thing as I'm speaking. I've played with it a little bit. It's, I think there's a good idea in there somewhere. I haven't quite nailed it. And the other challenge is it's pretty bandwidth heavy um, doing that. And doing it at home makes my computer, makes the fan kick on. And I'd be a little terrified to actually do it in front of a crowd on conference Wi-Fi. Uh, but that's the one that excites me the most. I feel like there was an idea in there that really excites me. And then your second question was, um, I don't think I ever feel like I'm done when I'm working on it, but sometimes I put it away for a long time because I think I'm dissatisfied with it and I just, I'm done. But then I come back to it like six months later and suddenly it looks more finished than I thought it did. So, you know, I, I feel like that's part of the process for me. Any more questions or, yeah. If there's cool. no more questions, thank you, George. Uh, <laughs> you can go and have lunch, but I want to remind you that other stuff uh, starts at 2.15, but the lunch finish, finishes at 2.45. So if you want to come here or wherever, we start at 2.15, so don't be late. And thank you. Thank you.